Thank you. Good afternoon from South Africa or wherever you are in the world, whatever the appropriate um, greeting is. Welcome to this further session of Winter School 2020. And it has been a, uh, an exhilarating series of conversations and no doubt today is going to be the same. Um, my name is Valmont Lane and I'm a researcher at the Center for Humanities Research. I'll be chairing today's session. We have a stellar cast of panelists. Um, uh, let me just talk us uh, briefly through the proceedings as we have it, and then I'll just um, introduce the panelists. So we will proceed with Heidi um, Greenbaum, who is um, presenting today. Uh, on uh, her paper is titled Leaving Zion. And each presenter will have 15 minutes to speak. Um, Heidi will obviously, uh, and now the other thing to say, sorry, is that we will assume that everybody or participants have been able to read the paper and we will take it as read, which is the honored tradition in the CHR. Um, after Heidi's 15 minutes, we will have Shai Gortler and then Ajo, and uh, I will then officiate a question and answer session. So let me just um, speak to introduce the three speakers. Heidi Grunebaum is a writer and scholar at the Center for Humanities Research, the University of the Western Cape, where she is acting director. Her work examines aesthetic and social responses to war and mass violence and the politics of memory in South Africa, Palestine, Israel, and Germany. She is author of Memorializing the Past, Everyday Life in South Africa after the Truth and Reconciliation Commission 2011. Co-editor of Uncontained, Opening the Community Arts Archive, Project Archive um, 2012, Athlone in Mind 2017, and the Poetry Chapbook Book of the Missing 2019. With Mark J. Kaplan, she made the documentary film The Village Under the Forest 2013. She is currently working on a collection of essays on non-partitioned aesthetics and a documentary film on the politics of race, racism, and Jewish memory in contemporary Germany. I will introduce the other speakers after Heidi has, has presented. Um, I also just want to alert everybody to encourage you to please prepare your questions as, as she's presenting and to make use of the Q&A facility on this chat, oh, sorry, on this um, course, not the chat. Please don't use the chat, um, use the Q&A facility and we will take note of your questions and put them in a queue. I, I will certainly. Um, so please welcome Heidi Grunebaum. Heidi. Thank you, Valmont. Um, and hi, everyone. Welcome from wherever in the world you're sitting this morning, this afternoon or evening. Um, just a quick uh, a roll call of thanks. Um, I want to thank Michelle Smith, Ali Khan, Lamise Lalchen, and Michaela Felix for running this year's online format of Winter School with such finesse and apparent ease under particularly challenging circumstances. I want to also thank our Winter School partners, Gary Minkley and the Saatchi Chair in Social Change at Fort Hare University, Karen Brown from the Interdisciplinary Center for the Study, of Global Change at the University of Minnesota, and Neil Tenkortenar with the Jackman Inst Humanities Institute at the University of Fort Hay, uh, the University of Toronto, for enthusiastically agreeing to proceed with and participate in a winter school that's in a very altered form during the pandemic. And my special gratitude, last but not least, is to Shai Gotler, and Ajoche Awungeja for agreeing to discuss my paper today, and to Valmont Lane, my colleague, for chairing the session. 
So for my paper, Leaving Zion Notes Towards a Possible Itinerary, I'd like to sketch out some of my thinking um, for my take on our 2020 winter school theme on Exodus movement, uh, the people, critical thinking and the collective. I'd wanted to return to questions I've been thinking concerning Israel-Palestine and which I've been trying to think through the prism of what non-partitioned aesthetics may be. I'm not going to discuss that today, but time and again in my thinking over the last while, um, separation, separateness, apartness, partition continue to return as a kind of normative outworking of the predicament of Israel-Palestine, including as a number of colleagues I'm working with on this have observed in international legal and political discourse. Non-partitioned aesthetics opened a way for me to challenge or defamiliarize the normative terms of the predicament of Israel-Palestine and to imagine it in a differently constellated field with anti-colonial and post-colonial thinkers in conversation with contemporary debates on race and difference, on aesthetic education, as well as with the epistemological inheritances for the humanities and its disciplines of a kind of, of a Eurocentric concept of the human. And here I just want to acknowledge the work of my colleagues at the CHR and the intellectual community of its fellows and faculty for opening the significant and expansive inquiry. Over the past year, I've engaged with and analyzed the implications of political Zionism's twinned negations. The first negation of Palestinian collective existence and the material traces of Palestinian life in historic Palestine, including the disavowal of the Nakba, which saw the first depopulation and expulsion of some 750,000 Palestinians in the 1947-1948 war for Palestine. The second negation is that of the heterogeneity and historicity of the Jewish diaspora and of millennia of collective Jewish life in Arab and African lands in particular. Analyzing the workings of these twin negations for partitionist separatist thinking, I nonetheless avoided tackling the question of Zionism directly, which seemed and still does seem a far too complex if non-homogenous political, cultural, spiritual, linguistic and intellectual edifice, if an edifice can be non-homogenous to tackle. Until that is the months long isolation of lockdown during the COVID pandemic, during which my encounters with the hyphenated term Judeo-Christian through two different itineraries suggested that it was time to look into the question of Zionism. Anecdotally then, the first itinerary of the term Judeo-Christian was prompted by my learning in May that the Italian High Court had overturned the Ministry of Culture's attempt to evict the International Academy for the Judeo-Christian West, established in an 800-year-old monastery in the village of Collepardo. The Academy, the brainchild of a well-known right-wing strategist advising the current US administration, and under the leadership of a former conservator's to a member of parliament in Britain, seeks to convene an international program of study on the intellectual and ideological foundations of Christian white nationalist thought. The Academy for the Judeo-Christian West is a culmination of ideas presented by this particular American strategist at a number of venues, but I'd like to cite his words at a Vatican conference in 2004 which was one year after the US's invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq. And quote, he, it's quoted in Robert Smith. He says, the Judeo-Christian West is in a crisis. And this is a crisis both of capitalism 
and of the underpinnings of the Judeo-Christian West. The crisis includes the internal threat of, quote, immense secularization and the external threat of, quote, jihadist Islamic fascism. For this strategist, the current fight to protect the West must be inspired by the past. When capitalism, I'm quoting, when capitalism was at its highest flower and spreading its benefits to most of mankind, my emphasis, almost all of those capitalists were strong believers in the Judeo-Christian West. Moreover, the long history, I'm still quoting, of the Judeo-Christian West struggle against Islam bequeathed to us the great institution that is the Church of the West. In July, the Phenomenalist magazine published Ariela Aisha Azoulay's letter to Sylvia Winter, Unlearning the Disappearance of Jews from Africa, in which she elaborates the implications of Sylvia Winter's seeming naturalization of the hyphenated term Judeo-Christian in her landmark essay, 1492, A New World View. Azoulay reprises Zionism's twin negations, observing that not only was the state of Israel created with imperial tools, colonization, partition, deportation, the nation state form, it also replicated the domination of white Europeans of Jewish origin who turned their way of being Jewish into the only way of being Jewish, a Judeo-Christian Jewishness. And I want to say, whilst I disagree with Azoulay's characterization of Ashkenazi Jews or Jews from Europe, I want to hold on to her challenge to the normalization of this term, Judeo-Christian. In June, sandwiched between these two itineraries of encounter with the hyphenated term, a dear Israeli colleague, colleague published an article entitled, What Would Israeli Identity Look Like Without Zionism? In, in the dissident online mag magazine Plus, Neven, Plus 972, which has also recently published a, a piece by Shai Gortler. And this paper is a first response to my colleague's question. Zionism is but one now hegemonic European Jewish political response to the failure of Europe to resolve its political theological conundrum it named the Jewish question by other means than it had applied to its other questions through imperial expansion and colonial conquest to populations across the planet. These means are assimilation, segregation, expulsion, and extermination. The Zionist enterprise in Palestine would then remove Jews from a Europe to which they could not belong before the Holocaust and the establishment of the State of Israel. Zionism was territorialized in Palestine, geographically outside Europe, enthusiastically aided and supported by most imperial powers during the 19th and 20th century, even if it was driven by Jewish settlers, refugees, and immigrants from Europe, initially through European techniques of colonization, that is, conquest, expulsion, and segregation for Palestinians, the victims of the victims, as Edward Said put it, and assimilation for Arab and African Jews, or Zionism's Jewish victims, as Ella Shohat has put it. But Zionism also stands as a response to the constitution of an essentialized collective, a political collective, in response to the shifting position of race and difference in European discourse, particularly with the shift of the figure of the Jew from a theological to a biological and political enemy, um, starting according to a number of scholars uh, with the uh, Spanish Inquisition around the time that Christopher Columbus went um, 1492 voyage to, <clears throat> to the Americas. I'm nearly done. In addressing the this predicament, Amnon Rusk 
Krakotskin and others propose the Jewish collectivity in Palestine has to be rethought through and addressed from the perspectives of the victims of the nationalization of Jewish memory. That is, from the standpoint of Palestinians in Israel, Gaza, the West Bank and the diaspora. And in a different way, that of Arab and African Jews in Israel. A critique of Zionism requires a larger frame that can chip away at the edifice of a Euro-American forgetting of its implication in, in Winter's description, the world systemic order inaugurated in 1492 that emerged from resource extraction, ecocide, genocide, racial slavery, and racial subjection. Inside that frame, the critique of Zionism may better examine why separation partition remains the dominant way to imagine a territorialized political and ethical relation between Jew, Arab and African and their various hyphenated and non hyphenated combinations. Inside that frame too, the central place of Israel as political assemblage tasked with providing a theopolitical framework for Euro-American, that is white Western Christian empire, as Robert Smith writes, may be better understood to more purposeful, purposively be apprehended. And if that Europe ever existed, which is also a question, the idea that Europe is or have ever has been white is part of the, the normative truth and um, and assumption, adaptive truths that uh, the, the, the very interesting and helpful term that uh, Sylvia Winter has given us um, to also question that desire that we, or that is imputed to Europe, um, to, to trouble that somewhat. And lastly, to close, I return to the final lines of my short paper that here's in the rhythm of Bob Marley and the Whalers exodus movement of the people, less a departure from Zion than a return to the liberatory promise of non-essentialist anti-colonial possibilities. That these may be apprehended in certain African, African diasporic and Middle Eastern aesthetic sensibilities is, is for the next installment of this discussion. And just to say, to share uh, that for that, I read uh, Sylvia Winter's novel, The Hills of Hebron, alongside Freud and Said on the figure of Moses, um, Chaviva Pedaya and Sami Shetrit's poetry alongside Huria Butelja and Ella Shohat. So thank you for this. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you very much, Heidi. Um, and you, your timing was almost perfect, completely perfect. Um, I'd like to invite um, our next speaker now. Um, Adjoche Awungija is a doctoral fellow at the CHR. Her work aims to take a critical look at individual and group discourse slash narrative practices and the mechanisms of identity and reality construction that emerge in and through these narratives against the grain of globalization and neoliberal narratives of growth, success, and ambition. The overall aim is to explore the dialectic relationships between the mundane and seemingly insignificant practices of everyday life and the self-maintaining tendencies of certain dominant socio-cultural and political narratives. Please welcome. <laughs> um. Hello everyone. Oh, um, <laughs> Hi everyone. Thank you, Belmont. Um, and thank you so much, Heidi, for a really amazing paper. Uh, I was just I just met this topic when they sent me your paper. So I have had to go through an intense learning curve <laughs> for this presentation, but it was really, really fascinating. So thank you, thank you. And thank you to everyone who's been working so hard to um make these um, sessions happen the way that they have been. So I will go straight into my discussion. Um, so um, Hades paper, in Hades' paper, she looks at the entanglement of and movement of, of in ideas in the construction of peoplehood 
um, in this case, a Jewish peoplehood and the role of the European enlightenment concept of the human in this construction. And into, she also goes into a, a, a conversation about this interesting term of Judeo-Christianity as um, you would have heard her explain. Um, to engage with this um, ideas, I would like to focus my discussion on first the concept of the symbolic universe and secondly, on the role of this idea of negation in the conceptual machineries used to maintain or modify um, these symbolic universes. So a symbolic universe refers to um, theoret theoretical traditions that integrate different bodies of knowledge and meaning and hold the institutional order within any given society in a symbolic totality. Within a symbolic universe, open quote, all the sectors of the institution, institutional order are integrated in an all-embracing frame of reference, which now constitute a universe in the literal sense of the word, because all human experience can now be conceived of as taking place within it, end quote. In other words, symbolic universes can be understood as the narrative, origin story, foundational myth, or legend of descent, without which human action and therefore history could not exist. Cameron and Palin, inciting Emile Durheim, notes that a foundational story, um, open quote, is not a simple image or reality, a motionless shadow projected onto us by things. It is rather a force that stirs up around us a whole whirlwind of organic and psychological phenomena. Representations, the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves and about the world we live in, are guides to action and forces of, changes, of change in themselves, stimulating and constraining the entire gamut of human um, emotions, from happiness to despair, from violence to love." End quote. Um, Berger and Lukman also add that all social realities are precarious. All realities are social constructions in the face of chaos. As, as a result, social reality is constantly being threatened by alternative meanings that lie outside of the scope of its symbolic universe. Foundational myths are therefore necessarily adaptive truths. That is, um, in all forms of animal life, whatever solutions to a problem are adopted by an individual organism or society must be framed within the organism's ecological context and for its own adaptive advantage. And this is a quote from Sylvia Winter. Hence, the foundational story of any given society does not describe the world as it is, but rather it describes the world from the position of and for the benefit of that organism, uh, um, in other words, adaptively. Negation or nihilation is a crucial aspect in the adaptive or self-maintaining and preserving missionaries of any given symbolic universe. Negation refers to the, to the denial or liquidation of everything that falls outside one's own social reality. There are two main ways by which this is done. The first is by assigning negative qualities to foreign entities, portraying them as less than or inferior to one's own reality. A common manifestation of this type of negation is seen in descriptions of the outsider as savage, barbarian, primitive, lost, you are familiar with these. <laughs> this, this effectively, even if temporarily, neutralizes the threat that the outside poses to one's own sense of normalcy in, the, in, in, in your everyday um, realities and your institutional orders. In other words, this assures the individual that they are living correctly and the other who's an outsider is not. Thus, the concept of the human as a Euro-American Christian white man could only emerge against the grain of Christian or techno-scientific mythologies and narratives that shape these societies. These narratives in turn drove the institutional and scientific efforts that went into the ways in which, open quote, species were taxonomically segregated from other beings and forms of life in a hierarchy of races, species, and nature, with man emerging as separate from and master over all others. Negation plays a crucial role in these categorizations as the definition or construction of man relied primarily on the establishment of what man is not, which could be barbarian, primitive, Jew, native, black, you know, 
<laughs> man as master of all further also became the foundation upon which imperialist expansion settler colonialism apartheid and other major forms of oppression and subjugation emerged the second way in which negation works is through the extensive study of the other uh, extensive detailed theoretical grappling with this strange other in a process that seeks to translate in a sense, the alternative reality into the language of one's own. In other words, it's the process of making the other make sense in terms of one's own reality. Once we can incorporate the alternative and threatening reality into the language of our own, it becomes part of our symbolic universe and no longer poses a threat, or at the very least, this threat is mitigated, which ultimately reinforces the primacy and correctness of our own universe. Orientalist studies that have been very popular in the West, such as like the anthropological ethnographies that um, were, have been carried out over and over that portrayed Arabs, Asians, Africans, and African people as exotic or primitive people that needed saving or enlightenment or civilization are examples of, these dim of this dimension of negation. The fundamental role of nihilation in the instituting of symbolic universes brings us to the realization that the dehumanization or thingification, um, to use Emesis' term, of the perceived non-human other is not simply a byproduct of instituting of the was, wasn't simply a byproduct of the instituting of the now overrepresented Euro-American Christian white man or his forms of life. Instead, it is inherent to its institutionalization and legitimation. The hypothetical admission of the equalness of all men will mean having to concurrently admit to the ultimate barbarism of colonialism, the Holocaust, slavery, Islamophobia, and so on, which will possibly put him in a paralyzing state of extreme guilt or, or at the very least, terror. This is where the force of the symbolic universe or uh, foundational myths become apparent as they allow the individuals within a given society to carry on living their lives with terror and guilt significantly or even completely assuaged or mitigated. Modern political Zionism developed out of and as a response to this perception of man and the worldview that placed him at the center and as the master of all. The movement grew out of the perception of the Jews as unassimilable or as impossible to incorporate into the Euro-American symbolic universe. When even after the forceful conversion of Jews to Christianity, the Jews continued to be seen as Christian on the outside, but still Jewish on the inside. If they could not be assimilated, then they were a threat or at least a nuisance to the social reality of the host. And to put it really crudely, they had to go. Similar dialectics can be seen um, if we look at Zionist discourses um, around the negation of exile. The nihilation or flattening of the heterogeneous historicity of the diasporic Jew was one of the main goals or tools um, of the Jewish political Zionists. The exilic Jew no longer fit into the narratives that we, they were weaving together in their quest to justify and explain the return to history of the Jews. In order to smooth out any ambivalence or discrepancies in the diversity of the of diasporic Jews, they needed a new narrative, one that would at once justify the justify the obliteration of the Palestinian right to the land and at the same time cure the Jew of the sickness of the spirit that was said to follow from exilic experience such as superstition, fear, resentment, political irresponsibility, passivity, weakness, and so on and so forth. For the Zionist agenda of creating a homeland for the Jewish people, despair was productive as it would leave Zionism as, as the only option for Jews who were um, trying to escape growing, uh, rising anti-Semitic feelings in Europe and America. Zionism as a tool in universe construction, in this case, maybe more than universe maintenance, sought to flatten, resolve, or smooth out these ambiguities by the construction of the image of a new Jew, um, one who could fight back and work the land that was awaiting to be redeemed, in this case, Palestine. 
in so doing, the people who were not a people based on their different his histories in the diaspora and the possible inconsistencies between their various evolutions would be integrated into a single narrative of a people. The second negation which Haiti spoke about um, which I also mentioned briefly above, um, involves the masking of a settler colonial project in the form of a spiritual, political, and material redemption, which simultaneously negates the collective existence of the Palestinians who have been displaced and essentially had their land stolen from them. The first negation, the desire to create a pure Jewish State that was undiluted by European culture, religions, and way of life, as well as just any other type of um, influence from other cultures, would justify the erasure of, collect of the collective of collective Palestinian life, while also excluding other Jews, such as Arab and African Jews. In a sense, in order to create the new Jew, the Zionist had to imagine himself as, and I quote, a rampart of Europe against Asia, an outpost of civilization as opposed to barbarism. This has striking um, resemblance to the discourse of human as man or as white Christian man that they sought to escape by creating this homeland in, 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 in Palestine. Systemic racism against the Arabs, Arab Jews and African Jews can be seen as internal to the Jewish polity in the same way that the definition of, of the human as man in the way that we've spoken about is in a dialectic relationship with the non-human status assigned to, and I say non-human in quotes, um, to black Jews, Arabs, Muslims, and just about anyone um, outside of the Eurocentric worldview. On a somewhat different but related note, and this will also be my last note, um, I thought the growing popularity um, of the term Judeo-Christianity introduced an interesting and very telling plot twist um, in, in, in terms of the, the, the power and the self-maintaining um, tendencies of symbolic, the Eurocentric symbolic universe. The term gained popularity in America and Britain during the, during the Cold War as they sought to unify their nations against the common enemy, which at the time was Islam and uh, was communism. And we can argue today is Islam. I mean, I'm not very familiar with this. I, I agree to be corrected if I have misread it. Um, it also became popular as the Christian interest in Palestine as a Christian holy land grew prior to and which also might have facilitated the establishment of Israel as a nation in historic Palestine. European Christian views, uh, European Christian view the return of the Jews as the ultimate conversion and the ultimate conversion to Christianity, if that does happen, as fulfilling the biblical prophecy that would culminate in the second coming of the Messiah. In this sense, the return to the to history that Zionism advocated for was indeed a return to Christianity or a return to the worldview that they, they had sought to escape. For Christians, Judaism in the equation or in the, in the term Judeo-Christian was merely a relic of the past that culminates in Christianity or in the fulfillment of the Christian um, interpretation of the bib biblical prophecy. In other words, Judaism is understood as the origins of Christianity and not as a separate religion with its own distinct set of beliefs. And these very same distinctions that had initially led to the evolution of Judaism as different from Christianity in the first place. So the idea that the establishment of Israel on all the negations that we've seen previously um, was indeed the white Western Christian colonia colonialism of, of Judaism, or at least that idea sounds plausible to me. This, I believe, is yet another testament of the self-maintaining and adaptive nature of the Eurocentric worldview that have been internalized by those who have been its victims, so much so that even an attempt to counter or escape or move away from it, ironically, continues to perpetuate it. And with that, I have come to the end of my <laughs> discussion. <laughs> I hope I didn't go too far over time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Adjo. You actually, um, everybody's been extremely efficient today. And thank you for those very um, concise reflections, cogent reflections on, on the paper. Um, I just also want to remind all the, everybody who's um, tuning in to post your questions on the Q&A 
channel, which is at the bottom right of your screen, and we will put you in a queue um, when we get to the discussion. I now want to invite Shai Gautler to do his reflections. Um, Shai Gautler is currently a Mellon doctoral, postdoctoral fellow at the CHR. After completing a political science PhD at the University of Minnesota in the USA, his research interests lie in the intersection of political theory, theories of subjectivity, and the philosophy of punishment. His book project, Carceral Subjectivity and the Exercise of Freedom in Israel Palestine, looks at modalities of subject formation at work in the Israeli incarceration of Palestinian political prisoners. Please welcome Shai Gautler. Thank you, Belmont, and also thank you, Ajo, uh, and everyone tuning in and, and joining the Yuna Baum and thanking you know, all the people who, despite facing so much uncertainty, put this year's winter school program in place, and especially to Michelle, Ali, and Michaela, and Louise. A heartfelt thank you to Heidi Grunebaum, not just for her leadership in inspiring the Winter Schools program, but also for crafting this inspiring paper. As many of my CHR colleagues know, the subject position from which I speak is of relevance to the topic at hand. I hold Israeli citizenship and currently reside in Israel-Palestine. For those reasons, I both appreciate the courage required for penning this text at a time when it is becoming more and more difficult to voice critiques of Zionism, and feel the many layers of urgency for which it is needed. Professor Heidi Grunebaum, who I will call Heidi from now on, offers a tempting itinerary for leaving Zion. Zion, in Heidi's account, is not only a physical location, and her focus on the movement away from it is not geographical. Zion is one of the many names of Jerusalem, and yet in the modern use of the word, it came to name an alleged solution. Europe's Jewish problem could only be solved, the European Zionists of the late 19th century contended, by geographically leaving Europe. The critical work of leaving Zion is not so much a geographical endeavor, but entails both a work of the self on the self and a work with others. The destination is a critical attitude that Haiti calls, quote, a liberatory promise of non-essentialist anti-colonial possibilities, end quote. In this meaningful itinerary for the journey, Haiti describes some obligatory stops along the path. The compass that leads the way is a reworking of Zionism's double negation. First, Zionism's negation of the richness of Jewish existence in the Gola, the Jewish diaspora, that is to be met with a renewed investment in diasporic Jewish culture. Second, Zionism's negation of what Palestine was, is, and could be with its people, the Palestinians, that is to be countered with an attention to Palestinian voices and a Jewish co-resistance with Palestinians. To leave Zion, to paraphrase political theorist and Yellow Knives Dennett First Nations scholar Glenn Coulthard, is not so much a work of recognition, either a self-recognition or a recognition of Palestinians, but rather, necessitates anti-colonial practices against the power relations at hand, practices that at one and the same time ignite the work of subjectivity. One target this project identifies is the historically constructed hyphen that connects Judeo and Christian and thus recruits Jews to a clash of civilizations meant to serve imperialist goals. With Ariela Aisha Azulai, Haiti suggests that refusing this specific hyphen cracks the current limiting molds of Jewish subjectivity. From the friendly perspective of a co-traveler on this path, I focus on how might such, such travelers resisting the molds of Zionism's negations meet the dangers of creating new molds, this time in the form of a fixed humanism. I will raise three interrelated points before concluding with some questions. First point. In any given week where this talk were to be scheduled, we would have some contemporary and urgent event regarding Palestine-Israel to animate the discussion. For this particular week, it is tomorrow's signing ceremony of, now this is a procession of scare quotes, a peace agreement, normalization, or deal between the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, and Israel. 
will be held on Trump's lawn. So this would be a good point to mention that I've titled these discussion comments, Abolish Lawns. The aesthetics of the lawn, the long-standing symbol of American suburbia, is symbolic for those who will shake hands on it tomorrow, alive and at home in their world, and yet docile, uniform, trimmed down, and devastating to our ecosystem. The Israeli settler colony's first accord of the 21st century demonstrates, arguably, that Sylvia Winter's persistent binary viewpoint of a colonial encounter of 19, sorry, 1492, or Césaire's discussion of colonization as thingification, provide important and yet insufficient tools for analyzing 21st century workings of empire. Empire not only treats some people as objects and discards them at will, but makes willing subjects. It not only excludes, but also includes. In last week's winter school session, Nancy Luxon discussed the movements of Agent Joe in this respect, as eluding simple colonial binaries of us and them. Instead, Luxon offered us an opportunity to examine the figure of the exchange, that is, to examine racial structures through their attempt to regulate movement, even if structures can never fully define a movement. In a similar vein, critical thinker and currently incarcerated Palestinian political prisoner, Walid Daka, discusses the contradiction that encapsulates the Palestinian subject position of being at once both invisible and exploited. For Daka, the imperialist treatment of Palestinians as malleable subjects is even more dangerous than a colonial view discarded them as objects. The, quote, relations of domination that Cezelle discusses are not limited to colonialism alone. They can persist in a post-colonial context. The logic of empire at work, one not limited to Trump's America and yet stressed in the language of the deal of the century, is one of inclusion of former colonial subjects into an order Cedric Robinson has termed racial capitalism. In other words, if post-colonial capitalism offers us a point where we are all included in a thin version of humanity, one that is trimmed down to a subject that calculates how to increase pleasure and avoid pain, then perhaps the end goal of a shared humanity that the paper's itinerary marks is insufficient for a time when economic interests mask themselves using similar vocabularies. If the liberatory promise we are walking in the desert towards is only a rejuvenated concept of inclusive humanism, I'd like to suggest that we should keep on wandering, looking, and cracking. Second point. The critique Haiti offers of the current arrays of power linked with the title Zion is not of the religious calling to make pilgrimage to Jerusalem, but of the militarization of Zion as, quote, a rampart of civilization against barbarism, end quote. It is not the rampart itself as a technology meant to impede movement that is the problem. Indeed, as Hagal Kotef argues, hampering movement can itself serve as a practice of freedom. The ramparts of the Paris Commune demonstrate that in some cases, movements can pose a threat while the barricade has liberatory potential. In more recent examples, Jewish activists from If Not Now and Never Again have blocked the entrances to U.S. concentration camps for immigrants chanting, Never Again means abolish ICE. International Jewish anti-Zionist network activists joined Palestinian American leadership and participated in Block the Boat to prevent Israeli ships from harboring in West Coast ports. And in Israel-Palestine, anti-pinkwashing activists have erected a miniature model of the separation wall to block Tel Aviv's pride parade. These activists, few as they may be, once again reclaim the rampart as a tool of resistance. I would like to suggest that we turn our gaze to the assemblage in Herzl's quote between the rampart and civilization. Rather than eliminating ramparts by including all religions and races in a shared humanity, what would it mean to take inspiration from these activists and to reclaim the rampart for democratic purposes and the creative work of freedom? A harder way to phrase this question is the following. Rather than completely rid ourselves of ramparts in favor of a civilized shared humanity on Trump's lawn 
white might instead a post-Zionist reappraisal of civilization. On the path towards a non-essentialist, anti-colonial subjectivity, rather than reform a figure of the human to include non-humans, might we consider the very undoing of the concept of the human? Michel Foucault and Giorgio Agamben both use the term desubjectification in their works, but they do so in very different ways. For Agamben, desubjectification describes what the Nazis did to Jews, Roma, homosexuals, among others, in the camps. In contrast, Foucauldian desubjectification is a practice of freedom that warns against molds put in place to define someone, pin her down to an identity, and declare untransgressible bounds. With Foucault and a new generation of non-anti and post-Zionist thinkers, we could ask what would it mean to take our resistance to Herzl's formulation, not to the role the Rampart plays in separating us and them, but to the notion of a strict, firm mold of the human. Third point. What are the degrees of variation in the critical work of mnemonics, of memory making, that is needed for thinking an anti-colonial, non-essentialist Jewish subjectivity? According to Ariela Aisha Azulai, to refuse the Zionist negation of the diaspora, to refuse being a memoryless Jew, means also to grapple with the different trajectories of Jewish diasporic ex existence. Yet, these include not just the likes of Rosa Luxemburg, Jacqueline Kahanov, or Dennis Goldberg, but also those Jews that served colonialism. Katie mentions that the Jewish memory she wishes to conjure up is not only non-essentialist, but anti-colonial. And yet, in many forms, even in the diaspora, Jews, as Albert Mimi reminds us, man the middle position between colonial regimes and the colonized. To remember a rich and meaningful diasporic Jewish culture is to already do some work to undo the Zionist trajectory in Israel-Palestine. Yet, it is insufficient in regard to possible colonial interactions elsewhere. What then would be possible degrees of variation in a mnemonic-oriented reading of aesthetics that could grapple with these different positionalities? So let me conclude my discussion of this truly wonderful paper with three very brief questions. One, what are the stakes for leaving Zion in the singular versus the plural as a journey one does on their own with conclusions that can only be reached by an individual, contra the need to think and act with others? Two, how might iterations to come of this itinerary treat the internal relations of domination within the category Jewish? For example, how do we limit the danger of reproducing current relations of power that are posed by an Ashkenazi Jew's analysis of liberatory possibilities presented by Jews self-identifying as Arab, Ethiopian, African-American, or Native American? Third and final question, which I will leave very open is, what role does South Africa play in this installation? Thank you. Wow, thank you, Sean, that, um, for both of those really um, provocative and insightful questions and, and observations. Um, before we go back and give Heidi an opportunity to start her responses, I want to remind everyone again, we've got a QA and a um, channel at the bottom. Please post your questions there. I see there are a couple of questions lining up now. Um, so shall we give Heidi an opportunity to respond initially and then we will throw it open to the floor. Thank you. Um, Wow, uh, Ajo and Shai, um, uh, I'm really humbled and provoked uh, and would love to read the text of your discussions um, in, in thinking about what I do with this work in developing it and opening it. Um, let me address some of Ajo's discussion. Um, Ajo, I really, um, you, I, I think you, you kind of honed in on very key moments that I was trying to think through and 
I, th I think you expanded and deepened the possibilities for thinking about those moments, um, particularly through the way that you were reading the, the relationship of between negation and the making of symbolic universes um, in which a kind of kinetic force of belief operates um, in obviously very complex ways and you 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 know you talk about the uh, relationship between institutional orders of reality that become that become both more coherent but in some way more totalized um, in this idea of in the making of the found, foundational truth um, of, of collectives. Um, the way that you can you connect the, the, the work of neg negation as part of a kind of counter kinetic force, you know, adds to the intensity of affect, I think, that one has to encounter in engaging the psychic structures of belief, um, the values and that that are kind of attached to, but also continuous with internal worlds and um, and the foundational truths that that one must in, you know that that one has to engage um, so just to to kind of think about the 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 relationship between the negation of exile the redemption of the land and the symbolic universes that or the some symbolic universe that these constitute and that you um, I think very with with great nuance kind of pulled apart for me um i think the the situation the case of modern political zionism in israel palestine is a particularly interesting instance of the to think about the making of the symbolic universes. Um, in, Zionist thought saw itself as secular, or at least it sought to kind of construct a secular European nationalist formation, um, territorialized in historic Palestine. And there were many debates uh, around how biblical tropes were deployed to kind of deepen the roots um, of, of this or, or strengthen the grounds uh, if, if, if a universe has grounds, um, I'm not sure, uh, of the symbolic world or symbolic order that it was drawing together. that the disavowal of um i don't want to use i mean I, I don't have a term other than religion but i think um jonathan boyarin's recent book on um judaism a genealogy of a con of a concept is very interesting in um in 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 arguing that the term not only is the term religion uh, an invention of uh of what he calls the Christian West, but the term Judaism um, is itself an invention of the Christian West, and that there's no, there's no approximate term in any of the Jewish languages to describe itself that aligns to how we understand Judaism and religion now. Nonetheless, um, the kind of um, political energies of the symbolic universes of biblical tropes um, have been at once repressed, disavowed, but also kind of um, 
permitted in, in almost homeopathic ways, I think, into the civil discourse on Zionism. Um, I think, I think the, the, the poison, well, no, let me not use, that's a really bad metaphor, but <laughs> so let me leave homeopathy. Um, the, I, I think in, in Gershom Shalom's letters to, Hans, to Franz Rosenzweig, where he worries about what kinds of, um, of, of, in a way, irrational energies will be released by deploying um, not just biblical tropes, but terms reserved for speech in a language considered uh, not just sacred, but for holy purposes only, not for the colloquial and not for uh, the, the kind of daily communicativity and certainly not as a lingua franca for um, in the making of a nation. Um, so I, I think there's a very interesting kind of set of convergences um, that your response of um, your reading of symbolic universes in Zionism might, might make available. And so thank you for that. Um, in relation to the figure of the new Jew, I mean, there's, um, I think that the, that symbolic universe continuously kind of reprises the bad Jews uh, and casts them outside. And Shai and uh, um, I think a number of um, a number of people on the webinar would have better than I uh, a firsthand experience of what it is to be iteratively named a traitor. Um, and and that is a term that is uh, reserved for, but it's not simply, it's, it's not an, an insult. It operates as a way to, as a kind of, as a barricade, as a rampart. It expels continuously um, from inside that kind of um, very complex hierarchy that um, Yerde calls infrastructures of, citizenship that produce whiteness in Israel. Um, as far as Palestinians are concerned, they were always named. I mean, the, 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 negate, the symbolic universe always kind of affirmed its project by naming Palestinians from the earliest days of the state, uh, never as Palestinians, but as infiltrators and as terrorists. Even in the discussion you, uh, in, um, a few years ago when I was doing research in Israel-Palestine for the village under the forest, um, I watched a, a television interview conducted with David Ben-Gurion, the first prime minister, and one of the kind of inventors of this um, secular, non-secular uh, uh, European nationalism that is at least Zionism in the form that we um, that came to be hegemonic, in which he was asked about the 750,000 Palestinian refugees that were made homeless, um, that were deplaced. Uh, and he refused to respond using the proper name, the collective noun Palestinian, uh, and he iteratively insisted that um, that Palis that those what he called Arabs who try to return are infiltrators who are coming to commit um, acts of terror against the new state. Now, this, in terms of the kind of um, iterative outworking of through various social institutions from school to the military. I mean, I think that schooling and military are two institutions in, um, in Israel that, have, uh, that are particularly important to, to look at in the way that over time, this, not just the symbolic universe, but the kind of foundational truth of, um, of the 
let's say the Israeli national narrative, um, continuously re-invokes the figure of the terrorist precisely to produce terror. Um, and it's a figure that is uh, an invention of, um, a, of an Israeli Jewish imagination. Of course, it has nothing to do with Palestinians. Um, but it has a lot to do with the fortification of the ramparts, which hold on to this idea of um, a, a peoplehood that is mirrored in the topography through architectural kind of markers from the early days of the state. Um, where settlements were established using the architecture of um, blockades, towers and blockades. Um, a military architecture that materially mirrored back um, a, 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 a collective idea and self-understanding of a, a psychically assailed and vulnerable people. And in the aftermath of the um, horrific genocide against uh, European Jewry, that production or and doubling of a figure of terror or, and for terror to terrorize um, had, a, a, had a kind of a, a psychic force that has been politically instrumentalized in a you know in a continuous way and one of the images that i was thinking about sharing today is a very powerful a very poignant um photograph that was taken during a uh, pandemic this year on uh yom HaShoah in israel on the holocaust remembrance day in israel of a woman standing with her mask her um her, her COVID-19 mask wrapped in a blue and white flag stopped on the highway outside of her car where for those minutes of silence that are observed and the entire Jewish Israeli kind of society stops wherever they are on the street, on the move, it frees in time to commemorate the Holocaust continuously re-import that psychic fragility um, that is activated continuously through the figure of the Palestinian as uh, infiltrator and terrorist. So I think I'm rambling a bit and I'll um, move on to, to Shai's incredibly um, rigorous and, um, and moving and thought provoking uh, discussion. Um, Shai, I, this, the um I, yeah i look forward to when we can when the skies open again and we might have the um the privilege of being in the same room to really think through the implication of some of your questions and concerns um i take i take your reading that what I'm suggesting with my non-essential um, anti-colonial kind of uh, collective, uh, which m may or may not be, uh, that, that, that is an open question. Um, but in response to your, 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 your kind of, your prodding as to whether the itinerary to leave Zion, whether it's individual or collective, I would say it's and also, it's both and. Um, I, I, um, and what that collective looks like, I think you've named certain kinds of interventions, but I think it, it, that it, it requires much, much more thought, but, and I want to try and see if I can end my comments there. Um, so you're worried about my recuperating a weak humanism, um, a la Sylvia Winter and um, M. S. Césaire, um, or I would even say uh, Franz Fanon, 
um, or as Maritz van Beverdonke is doing in his, you know, his new book, um, there's a, a, a not yet done with the human. Um, now, why would I want to stay with the human? Well, for one thing, I think if particularly over the last um 50 60 years where the notion of man as that 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 is imputed to a eurocentric concept of human being in the world um has begun to be chipped away at and sylvia winters writes quite you know i think her all across her oeuvre uh, there's a concern with that. Um, I think it's because the concept of the human that you want to be rid of is dehumanization. In other words, I don't know if we there is has been an exploration of what being human means. Um, and I, you know, I think Suleiman Bashir Jan is is doing this in in in. A, a range of other ways in kind of reconstellating certain uh, minor moments in European thought uh, alongside um, intellectual work that comes out of broadly speaking uh, West West Africa, um, but not only, also the Middle East. Um, we haven't given we we don't. We haven't quite figured, I've, or I don't think there's been a collective reckoning with the possibilities and capacities of that human. Um, and I think, in times of 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 kind of accelerated, both extractive capitalism in the twilight, uh, perhaps hopefully a decade or decades of um, of uh, fossil fuel, uh, of the fossil fuel industrial complex, um, but for sure accelerated ecocide and the impact of climate change. Um, the effect of extractive modes of being master over what we call the environment, um, a species centric uh, concept of separation and hierarchy, perhaps another mode of humanness can help us figure the broken, the kind of the sense of fragility, the shared or not shared, but the experience of being in the world and in relation to other humans, but also to other beings and creatures. Um, and my sense is that the human, or what you call humanism, um, is one way to to perceive that, to apprehend it, to touch it. Um, I also worry that the rush to the post-human um, and to the kind of, in a way, vitalist uh, discourse uh, smooths over the and 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 you know may be implicated in another structural forgetting that the earlier man as the only way of being human um has 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 left us with and in the ruins of so i'm not ready to leave humanism um but i'm very ready to think with you other modes um even if that means decentering a humanism um or what you call a thin concept of humanism um the the rampart for democratic freedom hang on degrees of variation in mnemonics okay let me take that before i go to your three um to your three 
super meaty questions, which I'll respond to. I'll try and be brief. I'm thinking aloud here. Um, so, you know, to, for participants that, have, that remain, I, I really appreciate uh, indulging me working out ideas as I speak them. Um, of course, uh, um, I, I'm, I'm not seeking a redemptive Jewish figure. I'm not looking for Emma Goldman and Rosa Luxemburg. And uh, although I am, Ilan Halevi is someone I'm particularly interested at the moment and have just received his 40-page uh, poem that he wrote in French um, in response to uh, Aimé Césaire's discours um, to colonialisme um, in the in the 1940s, he was born in the underground in occupied France, and he became the, uh, he, he served on the PLO's Revolutionary Council and as their um, representative in Paris until he died in 2013. Um, of course, I'm interested in, um, in Jewish figures, um, but not only. I don't think that, um, I, I mean, I, I think w someone like Franz Fanon, to read him as a recuperation of a certain kind of Jewish mnemonics could be a fascinating and important way of reading. So to read along the, the grain of a kind of um, Lyotard's notion of the Jews, right? Um, not in any sense of Jewish memory as essential as genetic. I mean, how to depart from the um, epigenetic framing of an identitarian kind of project. I'm not interested in that. And I wouldn't want to do that. So maybe I should have made that um, slightly clearer on the one hand. On the other, I, I also think that there are no kind of historical collectives, national or other, that in some way, particularly due to the, a certain exilic status, exilic in relation to the absence of state, not necessarily to be responded to by taking a state and establishing, but okay, that trains left the station. And these were, um, as you well know, and others well know, were very important debates that, um, that are recorded for us to read and, and, and to think with. Um, but the, the, the kinds of political and economic pressures that come with uh, collectives who, um, who rely on the hospitality of rulers um, produces all kinds of ambivalent, ambiguous and compromising accommodations. And I wouldn't put the burden of um, of refusing that or resisting that on any collective historically. I think the idea is to open up uh, the kind of messy, compromised, complex, contradiction-riven spaces um, in order to better kind of apprehend. And in that sense, I really like your idea of mnemonic variation or degrees of variation. So thank you. Um, I, I sort of sp spoke, I think, uh, to, to your first question about the singular plural and the plural singular, um, but I didn't do it justice. Um, how would this itinerary feed internal configurations of Jewishness in Israel? I think that is um, a crucial and critical question because they are concepts of Zionism and practices of Zionism, particularly in um, the most kind of subjected and marginalized and despised in the, in the kind of symbolic universe of the regime. Uh, and those are Arab and African Jews in particular. And yet that is where practices of Zion and Zionism, I think, um, are certainly not willing to leave Zion. <laughs> 
neither Jerusalem nor the, uh, the tombs of the patriarchs, nor a range of other uh, kind of benefits in a way that come with the power of might. Um, so I don't want to, un, you know, to, to kind of minimize or undo that contradiction by presenting a kind of a prescription for departure. Um, I would like to hold on to that internal configuration because I think that's a place to proceed also. Um, and not necessarily in the performative politics of the barricade, um, which isn't to say I'm not uh, dismissing that. Um, I think, you know, just reading or starting to read um, on revolution, um, the, the, the historian who, who did um, Hegel, uh, Hegel in Haiti, Susan Buckmorse's book on revolution, I think what she's insisting at, along with many others, um, uh, many other intellectuals and activists is that you, the, the kind of the turbulence of the streets and of the people's collectives on the streets, are, of course, not all of these are kind of progressive or emancipatory at all, as my own kind of presentation is suggesting. But um, the 21st century, and this is, uh, I think, a, a, um, a really important point, Shai, is that there are, there, there are new um, modes of, of, of political subjectivation that are unfolding and occurring. Um, and we haven't yet figured what, uh, what that is. Um, so I don't want to kind of put the ramparts um, out the picture, but it's not necessarily where I would turn to first for understanding this, um, for, for thinking this itinerary inside of um, the internal configurations and hierarchies of citizenship, which are deeply racialized. And in that sense, I think Zionism produce, has produced less, um, okay, Ali, I see you, has produced less a Jewish supremacy than white, than final securing of whiteness. And that's where I think the kind of conversation becomes particularly interesting. I'm not going to respond to how does South Africa play a role in this constellation uh, for now. Um, if, if with the chair's permission, I think there are lots of questions, uh, lots of comments, and hopefully uh, Shai and Ajo will join me in responding. Thank you. Thank you everyone for a, a fascinating conversation. Um, there are a f several questions. I'm going to read a few and then we'll take them in turn like that. And uh, panelists, please uh, feel free to, to engage as well. Um, so the first one is from Kan Kanita Basir. I'd like to pose a question about the international community highlighting the fact that Israel's creation of itself is a clear indication of its hegemonic existence, which breeds segregation of all people, religions, and races. With this understanding, it is clear that Zionism is the source of system, systemic segregation, which purposefully drives the colonial and superiority complex of Israel that allows for ethnic cleansing and the dispositioning of actual inheritors of the land. How does this understanding not allow for the dissolution of the so-called Israeli state based on its actual illegitimacy? A few more. From Marian Mugisha. Heidi, could you please throw light on the continuous negation of the African Jew, i.e. African as negation and Jew as negation, hence a double negation. Would you conceptualize the figure of the African Jew as representing the above idea? That is the double negation. From Uzoma Esonwane. Why exactly do historical experiences of persecution yield to projects of individual and collective self-making that replicate the dialectical structure of persecution that inspired them in the first instance? What is it in the symbolic universe of the persecutor, the Judeo-Christian world, the Christian West, etc., 
that impresses itself on the liberatory imagination, Zionism, anti-colonialism, etc., as if it had become or is now coded into its DNA as natural and inevitable. Sorry, I, I was saying Heidi or any of the panel. I keep forgetting that my my microphone is muted. Um, thank you for these really juicy questions, um, Kanita. Um, I think that you know your question relates to a much broader set of questions around states and legitimacy, but doesn't necessarily help us. So I think a kind of, uh, and I, I hope this doesn't, um, you know, I, I, I hope this lands in with the intention that I, I'm kind of um, sharing it, in that I don't think that moral outrage is sufficient to undo um, the various orders and modes and workings of power that um, that nation states wield. Um, and there isn't uh, we thinking from the current conjuncture, not about a future state to be established. Um, we speaking from inside of an actually existing regime um, that requires a different kind of response than what I hear as the, the moral outrage in um, which is fair, but not sufficient. Um, I, and you're welcome to clarify if I, if I haven't responded to, uh, sufficiently to, to your question. Um, uh, there was a question, the second question was, I don't know why I can't see them now. Uh, maybe I'm, I've got the chat open. Okay, uh, Marian Mugisha. Um, Marian, I think that's, you know, I think that's an incredibly important question. And it's one that um, I haven't thought about sufficiently and will as I develop this paper. But, and I would invite uh, Shai and Ajo to respond as well. But, you know, in over the last year, um, particularly Ethiopian Jews, Ethiopian Israelis um, have been, well, it's not only over the last year, but with, with the rise of Black Lives Matter and the protest movement in the United States, um, that kind of has traveled through the world, uh, which is a protest both at structural anti-Black violence that is, I think, the, the force of everyday life probably across the planet for people raced black um, on the one hand and a protest of uh, against the force of the police at every level including uh, the most literal um, who are the kind of who meet people raised black with the physical violence of that order in the everyday. And it's the same in Israel. Um, the extent of anti-black police violence, as well as um, racist anti-black um, uh, social public discourse, kind of political commentary, um, structural violence, uh, socioeconomic marginalization is, is particularly acute. For the, I think some 70,000 or so um, 
African refugees who are not acknowledged as refugees because then Israel has a real conundrum um, if it only acknowledges that it can be um, some kind of sanctuary for, uh, for historically for Jewish refugees, but through the negation of Palestinian collectivity had to disavow their experience of, of being made refugees. Um, there's a particular vulnerability um, that in, including all, you know, including um, incarceration in, in, in desert um, detention camps and, um, and at some point a, a, an examination of the possibility, a discussion with a number of African countries uh, that they would be paid to take African refugees from Israel, even if the, the refugee was not coming from that country, such as Uganda and Rwanda, and I'm just naming them here because they were implicated in that scandal. Um, that double negation, I, so my hunch in response to, um, to uh, Marion Mugisha's question is that there is a double negation working out there. Um, I think that, and, and I think it's really interesting that on the one hand, there's the, the hyphenated term Judeo-Christian. On the other hand, there's the equal, there's well, differently hyphenated, but the hyphenated term um, Arab Jew. There is no hyphen for Jewish African or African Jew. Uh, and I think that, you know, I think you, you're picking up on something that is that definitely needs to be thought um, through much more carefully and I, I thank you for that. Um, the question uh, from Uzoma Esonwane uh, I think is a great question and it's one that I've actually have on in a separate paper tried to write about which is the danger of developing political uh, political narratives the kinds of um, foundational truths that Ajoche was discussing from experiences of collective persecution um, that, um, that 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 persecution does not does, does not and victimhood does not produce a redemptive collective political program and usually on the contrary um, and I think that is both. That is true in, in many settings, including the kind of post-colonial world. Um, and I, that's a big generalization to make, but I think it's a, you know, the, the, the way in which certain kinds of um, really catastrophic experiences for which there can be no repair other than the symbolic and the material, but the material always marks marks rather its inadequacy, uh, which doesn't mean it shouldn't be <laughs> be made or offered um, precisely both in order to, um, to 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 mark its insufficiency as well as to mark uh, a certain kind of economic cost that is endured in the survival of catastrophe at a collective level. Um, Nonetheless, I think it's a, a very dangerous grounds for politics and it, it produces politics of grievance, um, of exclusion, and uh, it, it ensures certain kinds of cycles of political violence. Um, so thank you for that. W was there another one, Val? Let's, um, I first want to give the other panelists a chance to if anybody wants to comment or respond you don't have to but if if there is a burning need now's the moment okay so uh, can i i'm gonna select a few more um let's see robert Kricher says the christian evangelical judeo-christian project has jumped the atlantic to africa a, a while ago without however the imperial avarice i think here we have yet another layer of negation and that of missionary manipulation. See the stance of Chief Justice Mokweng Mokweng, for example, how to deal with this. So that's Robert Kricher. Um, there's a, a longish question. I'm going to read the whole, I'm going to try to 
too difficult to summarize. Um, Rituli Orlane, great paper, Heidi. Uh, sorry. The, uh, I'm drawn to a George symbolic universe frame. She unpacks the contradictions of placemaking for European Jews. Uh, I'm summarizing as I'm reading, sorry. And the contract contradictions of subject constitution of Jew, white man, while by the same stroke thingifying the other. So here's a statement. The burying of 500 villages in Palestine by a certain aesthetic that refashioned Israeli topography exposes the shaky ground on which precariously rests what may be called the founding of anti-Semitic racist myths for the modern making of a subject called the Jew. Heidi's paper adds the following. As a response to the failure of being recognized and incorporated into White's proper, the excluded if European Jew fashioned Zionism in line with the violent ethos of settler colonialism. I'm gonna skip a bit. With these in mind, I have a question. If this placemaking and subject making of the Jew in pursuit of recognition into whiteness is founded on such precarious ground, if we could call the gift of Caesar's sharp analysis of the crisis of modern man that, what could inform a counter aesthetic to this? What practical ways could signal a return to a liberatory promise of non-essentialist anti-colonial po possibilities? And then maybe a third one from Kelly Gillespie. Heidi, it seems that Shai is very kindly suggesting that you might mo be mobilizing a romantic humanism to get beyond the predicament of Israel-Palestine. He suggests that humanism might be insufficient for the kind of activist orientation that needs to break and violate this predicament. And he suggests that we might perhaps even need something like a blunt instrument or an orientation we might call uncivil to undo the regime. Does Winter's humanism allow you to respond adequately to the question? Does humanism cut it as a, usu a useful enough force? So there are again three very um, provocative questions. Mm. Heidi, you want to go for it? <laughs> okay. Um, so, Rituli, um, thanks. That's a great question. Um, I mean, I think what's, what Zionism sought to do was precisely to create that bifurcation that, you, um, that you've marked out. Um, between, wait, I need to find where it is. Um, what you call Jew, white man over against black, queer, African, Palestinian. And I'm hoping to argue, no, actually, that, um, that, that those distinctions are far less clear, actually, and far less transparently obvious. Uh, Zionism does seek to kind of uphold that, um, but, you know, a century of dissent uh, of Zionism, not only Jewish dissent, but also Jewish dissent. There was a time when Zionism, you know, there's an incredible Yiddish song called it means, oh, you stupid little Zionists. Um, <laughs> you think you're going to go to Jerusalem where you can die as a nation instead of standing, you know, on the factory floor and fighting with other workers for our salvation. Uh, you could say you stupid little Zionists in a Yiddish song a hundred years, a hundred years ago, because it was, there was an absurdity to this project. Um, somewhere, I think um, both humor and a kind of a recuperation of these deeply um, disavowed archives of, um, of ironization and of, um, of humor, but also of descent of subversion um, can help the undoing. Um, I don't know if that if that that, that responds to you, Rituli. Um, you you you're welcome to 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 kind of call me 
on on my insufficient response. Um, Kelly, if it's okay with you, I think I addressed your uh, concern when I spoke to Shai's, you know, final, uh, at least second question, um, or first question. Anyway, uh, Shai's concern with my, uh, what you call romance with humanism. Um, I certainly don't think that uh, the blunt edge of incivility is sufficient to bring down this regime um, by any means. And uh, I think it's one necessary tool and it's certainly not going to come from outside. That is um, entirely, um, entirely short. It can be supported from outside, but um, a regime of this kind of, um, you know, of this kind of robustness up to now, or well, I mean, things are changing, but you know, it's, it's not, and I'm, I'm hugely concerned about the South African analogies because there are the, the huge differences both in terms of the histories, but also in terms of the support for the regime. Um, and the moral outrage that, you know, that we have towards the regime is not what's going to kind of decombust it. Um, its own citizens have to do that work. And that is a work that I think is multi-fronted and multi, and, and it will take many forms. For sure, the work of ideas is 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 part of that kind of multi-fronted coalition that um, is in formation. Um, yeah, uh, is there? Oh, um, Robert, um, Robert, it's interesting that the it, it's a you're picking up on a really important point. Um, I don't think it jumped the Atlantic a long time ago. I think it's there's a form of of, of um, Euro-American Christianity that has always been missionary. It's always been expansionist. It's accompanied colonial um, enterprises, and it's the same kind of apparatus that um, that that turned to biblical Palestine in the 19th century with a deeply orientalist kind of set of, um, of glasses that, uh, of spectacles that were both um, filled with disgust for the actual people living in Palestine and uh, filled with romance for the way in which, um, and this kind of loops us back to Ajoche, the way in which um, the biblical, or the way in which the actually existing people of Palestine in Ottoman uh, Palestine could be translated into a kind of pastoral biblical landscape. Um, so, so the processes that have unfolded in this territorial, um, this, this kind of territorial configuration that was part of Ottoman, um, part of the Ottoman Empire, um, I, th I think is is very much part of the kind of aesthetic of spiritual redemption that has accompanied the blunt edge of colonial violence. Um, and I think you're you're a hundred percent you know correct in picking in picking that up. At the same time, but just to to come back to your point, uh, Robert, because you're saying something else as well with Mohueng, Mohueng with the current constitutional court judge, and of course people would know that, you know, just I think two months ago he was invited by the South African uh, chief rabbi Warren Goldstein to uh, speak on a webinar that was hosted by the Jerusalem Post. And he spoke about the, he, he, he really presented the um, Christian Zionist myth of um, the support of the return of the Jews to historic Palestine. Of course, Adjorn mentioned it, but every, you know, the, the end of the story of the end days is often omitted. And that end, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a deeply anti- it's a 
anti-Semitic racist story because in it, um, you know, the kind of final conflagration um, is, is unleashed. Um, the Jews who've gathered, the ingathering of the exiles is one of the conditions for the kind of return of the Messiah, um, would recognize the truth, the tr the, would witness the truth of, um, of, of the Messiah, convert to Christianity. So anyway, in that narrative, Jews are out the picture in some form or another. Um, so, you know, and that's in the very um, troubling and powerful political pact that the Israeli regime has made with the Christian evangelical world, um, which has a political project in mind. Um, uh, it's 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 a it's a strangely it's it's a strange invocation of the myth of Masada, you know. Of a, there's something of a collective suicidality in that. If one really thinks that narrative through to the end point, nonetheless, it um, you know the, the rise of Christian evangelism of evangelism. Okay, um, is uh, is one that you know is 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 taking new forms in the 21st century. And I, I think it's important that you put your, your finger on that. Thanks, Heidi. Ajo or Shai, you want to make any comments? No? Okay. Let me go, let's see how long we can keep this. Um, <laughs> we are now about 15 minutes before five o'clock. Um, a question from Moritz van Beverdonker. Thanks for a gentle paper that tries to carefully navigate a line through the very heavy grids of intelligibility that make this project so difficult and so urgent. Can you engage on the question of aesthetics that you broach very briefly in relation to movement, rhythm, and a people to come? Cezanne names this people that is not yet as black in a formulation that goes against the reification of race. There is perhaps something about the aesthetic that opens this, and maybe a related question from Kim Gurney. Thank you for, the, for this intriguing discussion. Heidi, you end your paper alluding to the liberative potential of the aesthetic you mentioned. It's for the next discussion, but if possible, can you share some preemptive thoughts on what you think of the role of artists slash aesthetics in leaving Zion in that project and building non-essentialist anti-colonial thoughts. Um, I'll take one more from Warwick Swinney. Bob Marley's song Exodus quoted is a good peg around which to discuss another Zion or the metaphysical Zion that for him is a place to move towards. That is the concept of Zion is the escape from Babylon or the West. Zion for him is Ethiopia or the whole African continent. He says in the lyrics, send us another brother Moses from across the Red Sea. So a Zion in the metaphysical sense opposite to the Israel idea. Maybe that's enough to go on. Uh, maybe I, can I squeeze in one more? It looks like we may have yep. covered most uh, of it. I see that uh, Joshua Reed and Mitchell Hunter also put yes. questions up. Um, let me read Mitchell's question. Could you think through the implications of the confluence of Zionism's two negations, which might be written as the negation of the Palestinian Jew, Jew, sorry, full stop. That is negating both the past Jew who lived in Palestine pre-Zionism, who was not Zionism's new Jew, and the future possibility of a Jewish subjectivity that thinks itself as Palestinian. Oh, where did that go? It jumped somewhere. Oh, after the destruction of the Jewish state. Shall we go with that? Uh, um, which was, um, uh, which was the first question I lost? Was Kim or Moritz? It was Moritz. It was Moritz, then Kim, then Moritz, Warwick. Moritz, Kim, Warwick. And then Mitch. Okay. Yeah. Um, The aesthetic opens up a space to think the excess, the that which is not inscribed in the kinds of concept categories that are mobilized inside of the discursive universe of um, 
of, of, of Zionism. So to step out of a discursive field in order to better kind of both disentangle, but also dismantle in, in, to, um, to estrange the terms, um, to open up the terrain, um, the aesthetic does that without necessarily declaring its doing. And so it opens up a space to read otherwise um, and to respond otherwise. It opens up a space for imaginative kind of um, work that is, I think, so crucial and critical for conceptual invention and reinvention, um, particularly in a kind of in and for um, an emancipatory politics. Um, so in a recent, you know, in a recent piece that, um, that, 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 that I wrote on Kamal al-Jafari's cinema, um, the, the argument I made is really available only through uh, an engagement with his cinema. And what his cinema does is opens up the possibility for thinking being and for thinking future beings and being together, not necessarily in easy and in non-conflictual ways. I mean, I think the idea, and this is, I, I do want to respond. I mean, I don't think that there is a conflict-free humanism, nor necessarily should there be. I think conflict, not war, not violence, not in the way that we kind of understand and inhabit the inheritance of, um, you know, of, of the ruins in which we, we live in different places on the world, but particularly in the post-colonial settler colony. Um, there... Mm -hmm. There is, oh my goodness, the Dean is calling me. <laughs> um, so I'll just turn that around. Um, that a, a kind of disavowed or the disavowed humanisms that may be, um, if not recuperable, um, readable through other trajectories, um, I think are made available through various kinds of um, aesthetic interventions on the one hand um, and on the other don't necessarily ask for the smoothing out of conflict right but to be able to engage and imagine terms of conflict in new ways and so there's something in the invention of aesthetics not of the term aesthetics but of aesthetic invention as well as in poetic invention that that opens onto the excess of terms and of discourses that become very tired and kind of stodgy and overloaded with the meanings that accumulate in them through their institutional kind of um, wieldings uh, for often very violent projects. And in that sense, I think the aesthetic is a very interesting you know, it, it's an interesting way to open a space to think and investigate the inadequacy of discursive concepts um, in order to return to them. Um, I think that Hang on, uh, from Mitchell. Um, Mitchell, I think that your, I mean, you know, the establishment of, well, long before, and Shai would know better, long before the establishment of a state, the possibility of being a Palestinian Jew was, you know, increasingly eviscerated with the, the challenges and demands that the yesh yeshuv, that the Jewish pre-state kind of settlement structure presented for indigenous Palestinian Jews. Um, and it's an interesting question because 
whether it's possible and how it's possible to reclaim that um, other non-hyphenated set of terms is one that I've heard uh, being discussed particularly in um, Israeli Palis uh, Palestinian politics in Israel. So um, it, Palestinians who are Israeli citizens, um, of which there, um, you know, there is a, a, a sizable population. Um, and that's where I have heard talk of that. Um, but I think it's a very, you know, I think like um, the, the, the earlier question about black Jews, although in a very different way, I think that's um, a juxtaposition a non-hyphenated juxtaposition that is is particularly important to look at in this kind of itinerary that I want to open up and think through, um, perhaps, or not perhaps, yes. Um, there was, I think, Warwick. So, so Warwick, I think, you know, the... Um, uh, thanks, that's an amazing, it's, that's an amazing comment. Um, the... In, in many ways, the kind of um, emancipatory fields that, um, that biblical tropes such as Zion, such as Babylon, such as redemption, such as exile, um, get kind of reworked in, um, in African diasporic aesthetic production is uh, you know i think sh we shouldn't should neither lose sight of it nor necessarily ignore that as a uh, as, as 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 a site of engagement for these kinds of non-essential um anti-colonial possibilities so thanks i think that's a really great but i also think it's important to mark the distinction that nonetheless those that those kinds of trajectories have not been you know absorbed into the kind of nationalist and status projects that um, the uh, the Zion of uh, of of you know of its kind of uh, very recent invention last two two or so hundred year invention in relation to the Israel Palestine question uh, is concerned at the same time. You know, there were always dissenting views on, on Zionism um, and different tra trajectories. So, you know, for example, um, Achad Am, who's a very famous uh, kind of thinker of what was, I think, called cultural or spiritual Zionism, um, you know, on the one hand was anti-nationalist, but understood that there was, on the one hand, a certain kind of relationship material link between the site of Zion and its possibility for renewal of some kind of collective Jewish life, not politically though, and certainly not in the state form as I understand, you know, as it became. Um, so I think they, you know, I think they're different hues and um, variations of um, inheritances of the Zion train that we, that might be worth kind of visiting, because it's not revisiting, yeah. Um, do you want me to, to, can I, can I, is that all, is that, oh, Joshua Reed. Can I read Joshua Reed? Um, or, before you do, I think was we are about to run out of time. Oh, okay. Uh, now five minutes to five, and maybe okay. we should close off, and perhaps you can take it up or Joshua can can um, engage offline. Okay. That's okay. So uh, I just want to thank Heidi for an incredibly, um, yeah, it's just such a rich piece of work and it's, it's pulled so many different um, conversations together that we've been having with this, uh, inside of the CHR. And certainly it, it gives us a, a much stronger sense now of the, the central theme of winter school. Um, thanks very much, Heidi. And thank you to Ajoche and Shai for your incredible um, contributions. You really, really, I think Heidi is going away with a lot of uh, very helpful and very um, 
uh, stimulating things to, to work with and to think with. Um, I, before everybody goes, I just want to also let you know that registration is now open for the next session of Winter School, which is co-hosted with the other Universals Consortium. The presenter will be Fadi Badawil. Ever, did, I, did I pronounce that correctly? Badawil. Um, the paper title is Radical Disenchantment, and the required reading is available on the CHR website. The date is the 25th of September, 3 p.m. Please join us for that. I'm sure there will be more um, publicity about it as the days go by. Thanks once again, everybody. Thank you to Ali, to Michelle Smith, and this, our colleagues at the CHR. And thank you to everybody for joining us today. Thank you. Congrats. Are we offline? We no, we still live. Oh, no, now. We <laughs> um...